Vivek Chibber is a sociology professor at New York University and an editor for uh, um, Catalysts, uh, a journal of theory and strategy. Um, his second book, Postcolonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital, started an important discussion on uh, postcolonial theory and um, the subaltern studies, which is uh, the South Asian chapter of postcolonial theory. Um, and its uh, theoretical implication and its claims. And on the basis of his book, um, Vivek will hold an input. So thank you very much for being here. And without further ado. Thank you, BAFTA. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, the occasion for this uh, lecture is the uh, publication of the German translation of my book, Postcolonial Theory and the specter of capital, and it's quite a pleasure to be here in uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung to be able to give the lecture, because of all the Marxists in the early part of the 20th century, nobody represented the combination of a fierce anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, and also a deep dedication to the struggles of working people, peasants, workers, all over the world, regardless of their color and regardless of their ethnicity. Luxembourg wrote at a time of enormous confidence among socialists. She, she was writing at a time when the labor movement was growing all across Europe. Indeed, before her death, the, one of the, mo the impor most important revolution of the time, which is the Russian Revolution, had occurred. But even after her death, this was the moment when, in addition to the growing radicalism of the European working class, the 1920s is also the era when socialism and Marxism takes root within the colonial world in the growth of labor movements all across first Asia, Latin America, and then a little bit later in Africa as well, most of which were led with, by socialist parties, parties committed to national liberation and communist parties. That was an era that lasted about three to four decades when it was taken for granted that the natural theory, the natural approach to understanding the place of the colonized world would be Marxism, which is very different from the era that most of you in this room have grown up in the last 40, even the last 50 years, which has been an era of retreat for Marxism all across the world, starting in the 1970s, but certainly accelerating through the 1980s. Well, one of the results of the retreat of the organized left has also been an intellectual retreat and a tremendous loss of confidence amongst intellectuals of the left in the place of Marxism as a theory that guides practice and that guides struggles for emancipation. As this confidence has now waned, some of the pillars of what we once took to be the socialist tradition, the preconditions for effective political engagement those pillars are also now coming into doubt. And I want to focus on two, which are the subject of my book, and which I think encapsulate some of the dilemmas that we currently face in social theory. Two of the pillars that have come under attack now, under criticism, are, first of all, the belief that the socialist movement is a global movement, which brings together working people of all races, all creeds, and all religions across the world. And the second one is that this global movement is in response to a globalizing system, which is capitalism, a system which originated in Europe, but by the mid to late 20th century had undoubtedly spread to virtually every corner of the globe. These two beliefs, whatever else Marxists agreed or disagreed upon, these two beliefs tended to bind them together across the world. Now, what's happened over the past 30 to 40 years, in large measure, under the influence of post-colonial theory, but in cultural studies more widely, what's happened is that not just these beliefs, but beliefs of this kind have come under a lot of criticism. What, what is the kind that I'm talking about? It's any beliefs, any propositions that are considered to be universalizing. That is considered to have scope beyond the geographical regions or the particular places where they originated. Under the influence of post-colonial theory, there's a general skepticism towards universalizing categories. And the skepticism is based on a few uh, arguments. The first of which is 
that universalizing categories are inevitably parochial. And what we mean by parochial is they take experiences and concepts that might be relevant in one geographical region and then they project them onto other uh, geographical regions illicitly. That is to say, they unfairly project onto other parts of the world realities, propositions that might have some applicability in one part of the world. Because they're parochial comes the second problem. They also then therefore obscure or hide local particularities. So a belief that might be applicable in Europe or a theory that might be applicable in Europe if it's transposed to India, ends up being problematic because it is rigidly imposing certain categories onto Indian reality, which in fact, it doesn't share with the reality of India. Now because of this rigid imposition of categories, universalizing theories also deny the agency of local people. They deny all the achievements and all the institutions that have been built up because they cannot see the actual nature of these institutions, the actual nature of the social structures in these parts of the world. And when you put all this together, the worry is the denial of agency, the obscuring of local realities, these universalizing theories easily become complicit in a kind of dominating, oppressive social system. They com become complicit in particular with Western imperialism and Western colonialism. So the general skepticism towards universalism now is also transferred to any theories which are dependent on universalizing categories. Well, the most obvious one is Marxism. And it is one of the odd reality, odd facts about post-colonial theory. It is the first time in the 20th century a theory claiming to be radical, indeed a theory claiming in some way to be emancipatory against the modern institutions of capitalism indicted Marxism as not only being inadequate, but also as a theory that was complicit with the imperial project. Now, this is something that picks up steam in the 80s and with the 1990s and 2000s has become sort of an orthodoxy within the radical community. But the problem, there have been plenty of critiques of Marxism in the past, and they're either right or they're wrong. It's not a religion, it's a social theory. But this is the first time somebody said the problem with Marxism is that it is in fact a creature of imperial expansion of Europe. Well, these are important criticisms, and like all criticisms, they're either right or they're wrong. To my mind, they are not only flawed, but these criticisms actually open the door to the revitalization of ideas from the 19th century which the polite term for these ideas is that they're orientalist, the plain term is that they're racist. The fundamental problem, let me be very clear, with post-colonial theory is that it gives radical garb to quite racist ideas. What I want to do in the rest of this talk is to explain how and why. The two particular pillars of left theory which I said post-colonial theory denies is the idea that capitalism is a universalizing system and the idea that the resistance to capitalism also has universal scope. So I want to examine these in some, some detail. Obviously, in a talk of this length, I'm going to gloss over a lot of the nuances and a lot of the complexities because we want to get to the essence of the matter. The more detailed arguments are in the book uh, if you care to look at it. All right, so let's start with the idea of the denial of the fact that capitalism is a universalizing system. It seems an odd claim to make. In the, at the end of the 20th century, or the beginning of the 21st century. An odd claim because it's quite undeniable that something like capitalism has globalized all across the world in the second half of the 20th century. How might it be that post-colonial theorists would question this? Well, they do it with a particular conceptual distinction. The base Chakrabarti in Provincializing Europe makes the argument that capitalism has indeed globalized but, he says, it hasn't universalized. So there's a distinction drawn between the globalization of a phenomenon and its universalization. Okay, now what might that mean? What he means by that is the following, that for capitalism to have actually and fully universalized, it needs to have also spread certain properties 
certain consequences that are supposed to be attached to it. In the absence of these consequences being visible, it's, begin, it's possible to accept that a certain carapace, a certain kind of phenomenal surface level form has been globalized, but the essence of it has not, in fact, been traveling with this globalization. So what is it that then needs to be universalized? What is the property he's talking about? What Chakrabarti says in Provincializing Europe is that for capitalism to actually universalize itself, it needs to transform the totality of social relations in any particular setting so that all social relations now internalize what he calls the logic of capital. They internalize the logic of capital. All right, so what does this mean concretely? It means that the local culture, the political institutions, the state, the ways of being, the texture of social relations, all need to start internalizing the logic of the commodity, of profit maximization, of commodity forms, and in some way, start to take on the garb, start to take on the same forms that we have found in the classical regions where capitalism originated. But, he says, look at India. Look at the reality of India. You still have things like marriage ceremonies. You still have arranged weddings. When workers come to the factory, they, they take a break so they can pray. They repeat ritual incantations as they're working. They are imbued with certain loyalties around community, around social obligations, around kinship, which you do not see in the West. They do not abide by the kind of bourgeois individualism that you see in the West. Capitalists, who should be rational profit maximizers, check and consult astrologers as to whether or they should or they should not make their investments. All of this, he suggests, is examples that while a certain kind of economic form has spread, it has not managed to sublate or sublimate all of the social relations of the area. And therefore, he says, it fails the test of universalization. Gyan Prakash backs this up. He says, Marxism has this grand narrative. That's the universalizing stuff. It has this grand narrative, and the grand narrative obscures the sorts of realities that Chakrabarti is talking about. And in so doing, it actually aids and abets the European idea that since the East is not partaking of this grand narrative, it needs to be educated. It needs to be brought along. If by conquest, then so be it. And therefore, becomes part of the European expansive project. Okay, so these are the kinds of arguments they're making about why universalization fails. Now, what do we make of them? Well, there's two problems with this argument. There are a lot of problems, but there's two which I would like to focus on. The one is this. If the test for the universalization of capitalism is that it has to subordinate all social relations to its logic, then it fails that test not only in the East, but also in the West. It's quite clear that all across the West, there have been transitions to capitalism, but where chunks of the local culture have been left more or less to their own, there is still a great deal of heterogeneity across Europe as well. And as William Sewell put it very well in one of his responses to my book when he was discussing it, he said, in agreement with what I'm saying, it's not clear what Europe means to post-colonial theorists. Because most of Europe, in fact, fails the test that they're setting forward. Indeed, if you just go across England, the original home of capitalism, you'll see so much local variation so many ancient rituals and ancient practices still surviving, it's quite clear that on their argument, capitalism has not universalized anywhere. The problem for them, though, is that they agree that the categories of Marxism are adequate for Europe. They're just in the East that they're not adequate. But now they're caught in a contradiction. If those categories are applicable to Europe, then by their own definition, capitalism universalized in Europe. And if capitalism did manage to universalize by their own admission in Europe, then you have to see what the grounds are on which we can affirm that universalization in Europe. Well, the typical grounds on which it's affirmed is this. Nobody on the left, no Marxist ever in the history of the theory has ever said that the test for capitalism's universalization 
is that every nook and cranny of a culture has to become subordinate to the law of value, profit maximization, whatever you want to call it. The criterion that's been used from the start is that a certain set of practices have to take on the same character. A certain domain of social reality has to take on the same character, which is the production and distribution of goods and services, what we call in shorthand the economy. As long as within the economy you see a transformation in which the production of goods and services is now subject to profit maximizing or to the, the, the law, the, uh, the uh, commodification of everything, then you say it's capitalist regardless of what the wider integument, the wider set of transformations is. And the reason for this is obvious. If you're a profit maximizing owner of a firm, you will seek to transform those aspects of the local reality which are immediately implicated in profit maximization. But if something doesn't interfere with your pursuit of profits, you're indifferent to it. So all across the world, as capitalism has spread, capitalists have, in fact, tried to transform those social relations which are impinging on production. And some of them are cultural, some of them are political. But as long as they can carry on their productive activities, survive in the market, and compete effectively, the wider range of practices is not much concern to them, as never has been, similarly with indigenous capitalists. And this is why you find that, indeed, as capitalism has spread, it has left a great deal of the social totality untransformed. That's not an index of the absence of capitalist universalization. That's simply what the universal of capital, universalization of capital means. What post-colonial theorists have done is imposed a standard for the universalizing validity of a category, a standard which it could never possibly meet. Much like neoclassical economics has a concept of perfect competition, which when you deploy it, you see such competition never in fact exists. And so every aspect of reality is in some way imperfect competition. Well, that's a sign that you've got a model that never was applicable to reality in the first place, so everything is seen as a deviation. Everything is seen as a failure. What right-wing economists do with their economic theory, post-colonial theorists do with cultural theory. All right, so if this is in fact correct, then I think it's possible to affirm that capitalism not only globalizes, but insofar as it does globalize, it also universalizes. Let me now move to the second issue, which is the issue of global resistance to capital. Here, the criticism is this. And again, it is Chakrabarti, but also Partho Chatterjee who makes the same criticism. The idea is that the Marxist conviction that as capitalism spreads, there will be a labor movement or a peasant movement against it, rests on the conviction that peasants and workers in the East think like peasants and workers in the West. Now, what is it that they illicitly assume about the mental universe of peasants and workers, that they react to capitalism in defense of their material interests. But the pursuit of material interests, the argument goes, is a Western phenomenon. It's Western because it assumes that Eastern people prioritize their economic goals above all of their other goals, culturally specific goals, loyalties, obligations. Secondly, it assumes that they think as individuals and they pursue individually rational actions on the basis of this prioritization of economic goals. But they say, as we all know, in the East it's community that matters, not individual rights, not individual pursuits, not individual interests. In the East it is non-material pursuits that define social agency, spirituality, community, social obligation, and such things. So this is an illicit transposition of a motivational set, perhaps adequate to the West, but quite inadequate to the psychological makeup. If you don't like words like strategy, objected to my use of the word psychology. I guess brown people don't have psychology. Okay, consciousness. It is not appropriate to the consciousness of non-white people. All right. Now the bald fact is, whether or not you think 
that non-Western people in fact prioritize economic interests over others, you do not have to accept that as a precondition for arguing that they will resist the encroachments of capitalism. Now, the reason is this. Even if you may perhaps feel that non-Western people are more, they assign greater value to non-material ends, perhaps spirituality, perhaps uh, some kind of community obligations, etc., artistic pursuits, even if you think that they attach greater value to those non-material ends, it is in f a fact about social reproduction that unless social agents have integrity of body and mind from the fulfillment of certain basic physical needs, they cannot be in a position to pursue the spiritual or artistic or community ends that they might place greater value on. Unless you have the ability to reproduce yourself physically, you cannot pursue any of the other ends. So even while it might be that Easterners attach greater value to non-material ends, it's still the case that if the economic conditions in which they're subjected imperil and undermine their physical viability, they have no choice but to prioritize those economic and basic needs of theirs just so they can pursue the other ends to which they attach greater value. Even though I want to spend the whole day praying, even though I want to spend the whole day working for my kinship group, kinship group if I cannot secure my economic viability, I'm not, a condition in, I'm not in a condition to do so. Therefore, it follows that as long as we can defend the proposition that the pursuit of your physical well-being is a precondition to the pursuit of anything else, you can sociologically affirm the priority of people's economic needs even though you don't morally affirm the first prioritization of economic needs. Now, that being the case, we come up with a sim simple question about capitalism. How does capitalism, in fact, bear upon the physical security and the physical viability of social agents who are in the working class or who are within the peasantry? The answer is quite simple. It makes it terribly insecure. What capitalism is is a system in which the income and the wealth of the people at the top of the economic rungs comes through extracting the labor of people at the bottom. Income distribution, therefore, is in the hands of surplus extractors, which, as a precondition to preserving their own wealth, in fact have to impinge upon and extract the income of those at the bottom. They systematically impose, therefore, income extraction, economic insecurity, and, of course, assaults on the physical integrity of their workers because of the inhuman work conditions that so much of the labor force in the global south is subjected to. Speed up, 16 hour working days, incredibly fast paces of work. That being the case, it's quite legitimate to then argue that whatever their moral valuation of particular ends might be, agents in the global south not only have an interest in resisting capitalism, but predict that they will in fact do so. And this, of course, has been the history of the past 150 years in the Global South. Indeed, as I show in the book, Chakrabarti and Chatterjee's own evidence shows that the very communities, the very cities that they're stu studying are cases in which their own historical research shows peasants and workers defending themselves on materialist grounds against employers, whether those employers are white or whether they're, they're brown. Therefore, just as it is with the case of the universalization of capital, I think there's ample ground for affirming the possibility and indeed the ubiquity of a universal resistance to capital. Now, if my arguments are right, then we can affirm or rather reaffirm these twin pillars that have sustained the socialist tradition for 120 years. But I want to go further. I think it's possible and I think it's imperative to turn the tables on post-colonial theory. The argument that Eastern people are not motivated by material ends, the argument 
that the culture of these parts of the world is so different that Western categories can never understand it. The argument that notions of reason, science, rationality are Western concepts, this is not the first body of thought to make this argument. This was in fact the founding stone, the essence of colonial ideology in the 19th century. For a hundred years, the entire left railed against the notion that brown, black, yellow people are essentially different from white people. For a hundred years, it was a pillar of progressive thought to affirm the common humanity of people across the world, which did not in any way erase or deny their differences. It simply affirmed that those differences did not go so deep as to put them in different moral and ontological universes. The idea that those universes are fundamentally different was something that British and French colonizers insisted upon because it was on the basis of the denial of that common humanity that they sought to justify the denial of basic rights to those people. Indeed, one of the most controversial parts of post-colonial theory is the critique of the idea of human rights that the idea of human rights is now a Western notion. Never mind that the charter for human rights in 1946 was written mostly by black and brown people. It's now come that even that is a colonial imposition. It is impossible, I would submit, in today's world. It's simply impossible to revitalize the left as we must do if we're going to save humanity from the ecological crisis, from the global spread of capitalism, it's simply impossible to do so if we continue to deny our common humanity. If we continue to deny that it is capitalism spread across the world that has imperiled our future as human beings. Now, I wrote this book six years ago. I was pessimistic. At the end of the book, I say, to my mind, the claims that post-colonial theory makes are impossible to sustain but it's very unlikely that it'll be overturned. There are too many academics, too many intellectuals who have staked their careers on propagating this theory. Entire disciplines now exist to defend the theory. And it's mostly black and brown people in those disciplines who defend it. It's been a cash cow for them. They will not let it go. And their enablers in the West will not let it die. The, the response has been violent and quite vicious. But, the last six years have seen a change that I never could have anticipated. We are seeing the glimmerings, not in Germany. <laughs> You're, sadly, after 200 years of leading the way, you're very far behind now. Not in Germany, but in the rest of the world, we are seeing the glimmerings, also not in India, uh, of the rebirth of a left. And as one would expect, it has, for the first time in 30 years, one sees the first steps towards a recovery of the moral, the philosophical, and the sociological ground for the left to return to some kind of confidence. I don't think it's anywhere in the immediate cards that ideas like the ones I've criticized here will be defeated or turned back. But I'll simply say this, there will never be a left again as long as it hews to and accepts these ideas. They are to their core backward and quite reactionary ideas. And if there is going to be a global struggle against capital again, it's going to have to be through a recovery and revitalization of those very notions that post-colonial theory has spent 30 years trying to destroy. Is there a future for them? That's gonna be up to you. Thank you. for your input. Um, before we head to the public discussions, I have um, like one or two questions. Um, in your input, you talked about um, the universalism of the old left and um, that it, does, didn't, um, 
negate the differences that existed uh, within the working class or the oppressed people of the world, etc. And um, it reminded me a lot of um, Fanon's uh, dialectic of the uh, universal and the specific when he says that uh, I'm a man and I'm a black man. So the universal and um, his specific experience as a black man. And I think um, that captures actually a very important point because I feel in some way post-colonial theory makes um, a legitimate point in criticizing um, a certain abstract universalism or the abstract universalism of the Enlightenment or the bourgeois ideology that says, um, yeah, all men are equal, but it doesn't really capture the experience of the colonial subjects. So how is it possible to talk about the differences within the struggle or within resistance and also the experiences of colonial subjects without falling back into this cultural um, essentialism that you criticized in the post-colonial theory? I don't think it's very hard, actually. Um, you just have to look at how people have done it for a hundred years. Uh, there's a simple fact that is very uncomfortable for post-colonial theory, which is when they say that Marxism and socialism are Western theories, they have to account for the fact that the majority of the people who accepted those theories across the 20th century were not white. In Europe, it had some purchase, it had some anchor, but the fact of the matter is the biggest and fastest spread of socialist ideas occurred in the colonial world. And the most important advances that were made for the longest time were in parts of the world that in Western Europe they didn't consider to be white, including the Slavic, Germans should know this, including the Eastern Europe, which for many years in Western Europe was considered a different race than the, uh, the, race, the, the race in the Anglo-English, the Catholic parts of the world. In the early parts of the 20th century, it's people like M. N. Roy, it's people uh, like Mao Zedong, whatever you think of them. It's people like Sun Yat-sen, who are carrying the torch of Marxism. Now, did they erase their local histories? How could they? The intellectual project of Marxists in the first half of the 20th century was to try to understand the local specificities of their countries in relation to Marxist theory. And all the advances that were made the theory of imperialism, of uneven development, the theory of rural differentiation, M. N. Roy's theory of the colonial bourgeoisie, all of this was made in order to understand local specificities. The thing about universalizing categories is this, it's simply a way of talking about what's called abstraction. A universal category is simply a category that tries to describe reality at a high level of abstraction. But as you move down from the higher level of abstraction, you are by definition taking into account local specificities. That's called moving from the abstract to the concrete. So just like in biology, in evolutionary biology, you can understand that a particular organism belongs to a species, but categorizing it as a species does not mean you refuse to understand the specificities of the organism. Just like, similarly, in social science, if you categorize a certain country as capitalist, it doesn't mean that you think the rest of its specificities don't exist. You simply think that those specificities exist within the constraints set by the, uh, the, uh, the economic constraints that are described by the abstract category. I don't think this is a mystery. I think it's post-cultural studies that turned it into something of a mystery. Thinking concretely and abstractly is just a part of everyday life. You do it all the time. You say, this is my, ho my home. Home is an abstract category, but that doesn't mean it's identical to everything else. It has its local specificities, and you describe those in the discussion of what it is. So I don't think there's a deep philosophical problem in moving from the abstract to the concrete, from the universal to the particular. Yeah, I would also add that um, when you analyze the different um, the situation the colonial subjects are in and the situation European workers are in, it's not that difficult to um, locate the difference in the material conditions and not in um, culture or some religion or yeah, whatever. 
Um, I have one more question and then we can head to the public discussion. Um, you talked about how um, capitalism also universalized uh, this, um, the resistance against capital and how um, all forms of resistance against capitalism have one thing in common and that is, um, yeah, in an abstract way we could say uh, like uh, the need for material safety. And um, what would you say is the difference between like uh, resistance against capitalism and resistance in general? Because when you when we look into the like the beginning of the Communist Manifesto, when Marx um, says that uh, you know the history of all hetero existing society is the history of class struggle, he um, views this kind of resistance as being part of every society in which social inequality exists. So what's the difference between struggle against capitalism and yeah, struggle in other societies, maybe? Um, a couple of points. Uh, I'm glad you brought this up, Bafta. Um, if you agree with the proposition, and ironically, a lot of people in cultural studies do, if you agree that wherever there is oppression, there will also be resistance, then you believe that there is a human nature across culture. Then you're saying that even a black person can understand through the haze of their spirituality and their local customs and whatever their habits are, even a black person can understand that being oppressed sucks. <laughs> even a brown person, perhaps even a Muslim, <laughs> can understand that oppression is a bad thing. But if you, say, if you affirm that empirical observation, then you're also saying that cultures do not go all the way down. You're also saying then there, there's some common element that people have across time and across geography, which when they encounter certain forms of social domination, elicits a broadly similar response. When Marx says, all history hitherto is the history of class struggle. He cannot maintain that proposition unless he also thinks that black, brown, and yellow people engage in class struggle. And he's not saying class struggle against white people. He's saying class struggle against oppression. Now, okay, that's an empirical proposition. Is it true? Well, simple question. In the pre-modern era, before they learned from Europeans that oppression is a bad thing, did black and brown people engage in resistance to their exploitation by their own oppressors? Well, the obvious answer is yes, that's what peasant revolts have been. The entire history of settled agrarian societies where we know have some record, other than Europe, Asia, East Asia especially, but to a lesser extent, but also South Asia, has a pretty rich record once classes arose. What is the history of these countries? Unyielding resistance by peasants to rent demands, to military demands, unyielding. Why? Apparently it's a mystery because they don't have physical material needs, it turns out. So this is where we are after 120 years of socialism, after the defeat of the left, where we should be asking the really hard questions about political strategy, how to deal with outsourcing, what, what the commodification of land means. We're having debates over whether black people understand that oppression is a bad thing. This is how far we've fallen. So now your concrete question was, is there a difference between uh, pre-capitalist resistance and capitalist? Well, the, the, the resistance is in form. That is to say, since the form of social oppression and exploitation is different in capitalism than in feudalism, let's call it feudalism or whatever you want, tributary modes of production, uh, the, the specifics to what the resistance is will be different. Resistance to, say, corvée labor and serfdom is going to be different from resistance to, for example, the suppression of wages. So the, the form that it takes will be different but the motivation is the same. The motivation is a desire to defend your physical, bodily integrity. I don't want to fetishize, I know you all, you're all faculty, you love the body, so don't get nervous. Uh, it's nothing mysterious, it just means your ability to survive, that's all. Uh, but that has been, sadly, what's been behind 
in most human history, class struggles have been about just eking out a living because the level of productive forces was low enough that most peasants lived on the edge of subsistence, and until recently, most workers did too. Uh, so I think while the form is different, the motivation is, has been more or less the same. <laughs>